you from the shoreline As your ships came sailing We thought you came in friendship And so we took you in Shared everything we had Even gave you gold It seems what we didn't get Your people said please go You called me Indian giver Then took it all I want you to this story of tribal fires, nations go to war. I want to give uh, this story a tribute to the great nations of the North American Indians, the Comanches. Their homelands stretch from Nebraska to the southern areas of Texas and their dialects have been affected by the Aztec languages and I want to give a recognition to the great war chief and warrior, Pana Parker. And he was a feared um, leader of his people. So this story is a tribute to the great nation of the Comanche people, Native Americans. This story, I'll start by talking about one of its titles, which is Nations Go to War. And the reason that we, you know, put that as part of the title is because when Western countries and, you know, particular the British Empire and the empires of European countries like France and uh, Spain and other countries have declared war by means of, uh, you know, conquering lands and taking the land under their own um, control and and ownership and also um, the way in which those same empires have colonised Indigenous peoples' lands worldwide. And, you know, when you look at um, war and you look at the empires of the Western world, they obviously, you know, are there first and foremost to conquer that country for its land, but they're not at all interested in the currency of that country. Money is not a spoil or a booty of war. But what is, is obviously... In taking the land, they must also destroy those people's cultures and their history. So in doing that, what we, you know, had found was that a lot of the, you know, um, treasures of the cultural history of a country is pillaged. You know, we refer to it at times as, you know, tomb raiders or, you know, uh, grave robbers. And, you know, when you look at um, countries and what happened in Egypt, and in particular the Great Pyramids of Giza and, you know, Tutankhamun's um, tomb and other treasures that laid within uh, the pyramids, a lot of the jewellery, the gold, statues, pottery in which, you know, the pharaohs were to take into the next world in terms of, you know, the richness of their, their wealth and the recognition of them as pharaohs and kings, was plundered by primarily uh, English archaeologists and Italian archaeologists. And it's a a, massive loss to a country and its peoples when, you know, you see this type of tomb raiding and, um, you know, uh, pillaging, plundering of, uh, you know, of of history. And I suppose you look at, um, you know, what actually lies in the... uh, you know, the vaults, if you like, or within institutions in England and Europe, you start to see the impact that, you know, taking of these relics and, and history really has on the impact of, uh, of people. Just to name a few of these treasures and relics in which the, you know, British Empire and others have taken out of countries, and I want to refer to this particular um, issue that, you know, was to do with the kingdom of Benin, now in its modern day called Nigeria. It proudly boasted several thousand bronze sculptures that adorned the royal palace, dating back to the 13th century. 
But in 1897, the British Empire sent troops on a punitive expedition to punish Benin rebels who retaliated against imperial power. The Empire's soldiers sacked and looted the city, bringing an end to the Kingdom of Benin. The Parthenon marbles, also known as the Elgin marbles, are another source of heated debate over repatriation for the British Museum. The marbles, which depict festival goers celebrating the birthday of the goddess Athena and centaurs and lapis engaged in battle, were taken from the Parthenon in Greece between 1801 and 1805. Sitting at the top of the velvet and the platinum crown of the Queen of England is the Kohanor, one of the largest cut diamonds in the world, meaning the Mountain of Light. The jewel originally adorned the Mughal peacock throne. It changed hands several times among warring factions until it was ultimately handed to the Queen of England, Queen Victoria, after the British annexation of India in 1849. The tiger was created for Tipu Sultan, the ruler of the kingdom of Mysore in India in the 18th century. Tipu's main symbol was the tiger, which he incorporated into his throne. Weapons, soldier uniforms and palace decorations. After Tipu lost the battle to the East Indian Company in 1799, British forces killed the Sultan and took the toy tiger from his summer palace, along with dismantled pieces of his throne. It is now on display at the Victoria and the Albert Museums. The Rosetta Stone, which resides in the British Museum, is regarded as a monumental object that enabled researchers to decipher and understand the cultures and the history of ancient Egypt. The stone was originally taken from Egypt by Napoleon Bonaparte, who is widely credited for opening up the country to the rest of Europe and fueling Egyptomania in the 19th century. According to Akiyugulu, the British then took the Rosetta Stone after they defeated the French in 1815. Decapitated and dried and tattooed Maori heads are on display at various European museums including the British Museum. When you look at the Maori heads and you know that they're, you know, obviously mummified and they're in museums around England, I think you can then make a comparison also of the fact that all of the skeletal remains that were taken from our old people, you know, our ancestors, where they had their heads hacked off and skulls were taken right throughout different laboratories around the world and studied by, you know, anthropologists and biologists and people to whom study the, the human body. And, you know, a lot of those skulls were, you know, after that research was done, was, you know, told to us by some of the elders that, you know, were used to stump out massive cigars because they took place and were taken to aristocrats' homes in Britain and Europe and uh, used as uh, ornaments. And, um, yeah, it's, it's like, you know, the vampire project or dub vampire project that took place globally in terms of studying again uh, human biology and the body and and all the manifestations of what you know is part of the human condition, such as blood, um, flesh, bones, even eyes were taken from the world's indigenous peoples to be studied in terms of um, you know, understanding uh, you know, the makeup. Of a, of a human being. And I want to just also uh, talk briefly about some of my own personal experiences. I remember um, you know, vividly a trip I had probably back in 1997 and I went to Canada and the United States and I met with the Chiefs of Ontario in Toronto and they made it possible for me to be able to visit the Museum of Mankind in Toronto. And the reason I wanted to visit that particular museum, because it is one of the, you know, one of the greatest uh, depositories, if you like, 
um, of uh, sacred objects and cultural materials from the world's Indigenous peoples, but particularly the South Pacific Rim and Australia falls within that collective. And I you know, made my way to the museum and firstly it was difficult to get into, you know, the collection. I was talking to, you know, people at the, uh, you know, reception area of the uh, museum and first and foremost they asked what type of qualifications I had and I had to tell them, well, I had no qualifications the only qualification I had was my direct link to these objects and the sacred objects in particular, but also to the pre-colonial dated um, objects that I had in their possession, such as boomerangs, shields and spears. And, you know, my connection was to the bloodline of our ancestors. But, of course, in America, you know, academia counts as a status of access to, you know, these very important um, collectives. So, you know, they wanted to know whether I was an anthropologist or an archaeologist and I said no. But anyway, you know, I talked my way into the collection and it was a really daunting and a um, massive experience which I'll, I'll remember for a long time. And, you know, I remember them saying that there will be a person or staff member shortly down so that, you know, they can take me through to the collections and, you know, in a short period of time, a woman turned up and she was saying that she was the archaeologist that was, um, you know, in charge, if you like, or supervised the Australian collection. And she said, well, I'll take you through Mr. Eggington and I'll, um, you know, show you the, uh, the collective. And I said to her, and I remember saying that, look, you know, the first protocol really should be that, you know, a male takes me through in relationship to the particular objects in which I was most, you know, wanting to see the sacred objects, that it would be more the protocol and in accordance to our culture uh, that a male takes me through to that collective and not a woman. So, you know, she was a little bit offended by that and, however, she said, no, I'm the only one available, so if you want to have a look at the collective while you're here, you have to go through with myself. So... I did, and I remember walking through and into the institution, and you know it was an eerie feeling because you know it was a massive, massive um, you know uh, room that was you know the main chamber of the museum, and there were these massive compactuses that you know held all the uh, materials, all the objects. So as we started to walk towards the you know, area in which obviously held the Australian objects and artefacts, I started to look down onto some of the, you know, other cases and uh, cabinets in which they had. And I remember seeing really old, um, you know, Native American uh, arrows um, where you could see the arrowhead and but the feathers were all, um, you know, moulded and sort of um, netted at the end of the arrow. And then I remember seeing all the bows and I thought to myself, wow, that's uh, what an incredible thing to be able to look at was this really old and ancient bow and arrow. And, you know, there was a number of them. And then I started to see things like, you know, old uh, moccasins, I remember. And I also saw, um, you know, uh, headbands and uh, what they would call war bonnets. And, you know, then I started to realise that... Um, you know, once all of these objects had been taken from, you know, Indigenous people, that was a direct impact, obviously, on their culture, their heritage, and the continuation of ceremonies linked to land. And as I, you know, commenced you know, following her, I could feel this massive uh, spiritual sort of connection or, or, or a pull on my spirit. And... Anyway, I kept walking and uh, then again um, I started to see, you know, a whole array of shells and then I noted, uh, you know, a label there saying, you know, Hawaiian artefacts and objects. But I still could feel this, this, this real spiritual power and I couldn't really identify where it was sort of, you know, merging from. So anyway, we got close to the Australian collection and at that time then I looked up on the ceiling of this room which was a pretty high ceiling, as you could imagine, being in a massive big facility like this museum. But they had uh, 
on the ceiling area this huge, massive uh, totem pole. And the totem pole obviously was one of those totem poles that were carved from those huge big trees in uh, America, the red gums and others. And, you know, when I looked up at the ceiling, I can remember seeing the wing spans of the eagle head that was on top of the totem pole and all the most beautiful, however faded, um, you know, applied uh, earth paints like the ochres and that, that, you know, this totem pole was just huge and incredible. And for a moment I just imagined how powerful that would have been as it was in the land carved from the, you know, tree trunks and uh, however, you know, that was used in terms of the uh, culture and the ceremonies of uh, the North American Indians. And... uh, it was a pretty incredible and powerful experience. So anyway, we got to the Australian collection and there in that collection, as she opened the uh, drawers of this huge big compactus cabinet, um, were just hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of boomerangs. There were, you know, there were about three big drawers full of boomerangs and then, you know, the next number were all the shields and, you know, as she started to show me the uh, spears and, you know, this was just prior to the sacred objects, I started to realise there and then that, you know, in a short period of time when, you know, all of these objects and, uh, you know, Aboriginal uh, weaponry and, you know, what they used to hunt and to, um, you know, uh, other purposes, once you remove that that great, uh, you know, thousands of objects, how quickly the culture could be broken down. So, um, you know, that was one of the experiences and, a you know, a, a lesson, if you like, or a, an enlightenment that I got from being able to see those collectives. Then, you know, she took me to a area that had, you know, a vault-type door and we entered into it and they referred to it as the vaults and that's where all the sacred objects were and... That's where I suppose my first experience of being in connection with such, you know, a huge amount of uh, sacred objects to our people and to our ancestors, you know, ceremonial uh, links with the land and the spiritual world that, yeah, it just was mind-blowing to think that all of this material that was taken out of this country here now laid within the um, vaults and within the, you know, sectors within Toronto's Museum of Mankind. And that's when I first started to understand that as Aboriginal people, we need to put a real emphasis and a priority onto the repatriation of our cultural materials all around the world. And I understand that there's massive collections in the Vatican's vaults and cabinets in um, Italy. They have a huge collection of Aboriginal artefacts and sacred objects. So, you know, as you know, Aboriginal people, we need to repatriate those objects, not so that they can go into the institutions or the museums back here in Australia, but I do believe the government should fund keeping uh, rooms and places right across this country, in every state, so that when these, you know, materials and objects are repatriated, we as a community can hold them in our own, um, you know, ownership through our own facilities. So, um, you know, that was uh, an experience. And then I also visited the Eucla, um Museum, uh, the University of California, and their collectives were, you know, maybe not as large as the Museum of Mankind in Toronto, but just as important because, you know, they had a massive amount of, um, of uh, sacred objects uh, within their collective. So uh, in... Looking, you know, at that, again, I started to understand that, you know, this type of exploitation and this type of, you know, uh, theft, if you like, of, you know, what's owned by our people, you know, has an impact. If we can, you know, rejuvenate and repatriate these objects and hold them again in our own communities, it can only be for the betterment of the strength of our future generations. And when we first started um, looking at 
the Marlo Morgan campaign. This was a number of years later in Dumbatung here. We started to uh, do up the initial, um, I suppose, media releases and we started to, you know, create the media conferences that would lead on to, you know, Dumbatung's uh, one of our most coordinated and recognised initiatives, which was to um, debunk the hoax of this woman who wrote this book in America. So at that time I remember a lot of people coming into Dumbatung and they were just really wanting to see, you know, this woman and had asked whether I had photos of her and I did have. So, you know, I'd be showing people photos and then it sort of dawned on me to actually maybe put the photo up on the wall at Dumbatung and, you know, just mark underneath the photo, Marlo Morgan, America. Uh, and that was followed by Mutant Message Down Under. That was the name of the book. So that particular photograph initiated a massive um, uh, display here, which we called the Wall of Shame. I mean, you know, we were aware of cultural exploitation, of course, before the Marlo Morgan campaign, but we never unified as a as a you know whole race, if you like, of people right across this country to define strategies in which to deal with these sorts of issues. So the Wall of Shame was set up. And I'll just have Selena read out the uh, content of what, uh, you know, made up the wall of shame because it was obviously well more than just that book that she had written and more so um, than just the trinklets. And we'll show you some of those examples shortly as well. But Selena will just go through what constituted the content of the wall of shame. Wall of shame, a dump and tongue initiative. The Wall of Shame was commenced by Dumbatung Aboriginal Corporation in 1994. It was originally set up showing photographs and media articles on the Marlowe Morgan campaign. Due to extensive interest in the issues of intellectual property rights and cultural ownership, questions it has expanded to encompass most of the wall's space providing examples on the impact of 1. Ecotourism on sacred significant sites areas 2. The appropriation of Aboriginal art styles and symbols reflecting the western and central desert regions being graphically designed and incorporated by non-Aboriginal artists 3. Tourism commodities and products, which are made by non-Aboriginal companies for sale in souvenir outlets such as airport souvenir shops, etc. 4. Cultural material exploitation gives examples of the commercialisation of Aboriginal cultural material such as the didgeridoo, bullwarer, etc. by non-Aboriginal companies and individuals. 5. Exploitations of ecological knowledge gives examples of the ways in which Nyungar ownership of knowledge regarding medicine plants, flora and fauna, for example, is commercialised and exploited by herbalists and state government departments, such as conservation and land management. 6. Traditional music, dance and arts. This section of the wall clearly gives indication of the ways in which Aboriginal music, dance and art is appropriated for cultural use by non-Aboriginal expressionists. 7. Stolen cultural and ceremonial objects reflects the mass extraction of cultural material from Aboriginal communities by government institutions such as the museums, religious bodies, etc., 8. Identity Appropriation. This section gives examples of media articles focusing on individuals who have claimed an identity by means of fraudulent methods such as Marla Morgan, Colin Johnson, Elizabeth Durack and Carmen, Leo Carmen. The wall of shame has been maintained to allow people to recognise the extent of Aboriginal cultural appropriation and exploitation. Just to uh, reiterate on those points in which Selena had read that constitutes the 
you know, wall of shame and what it actually uh, displayed at the time it was up here at Dumbertung. I want to just go to the first point, the ecotourism on sacred and significant side areas. And I think one of the important things to, you know, take note of is the damage done to the sites through ecotourism. And, of course, one of the major tourist attractions now in the world would be, you know, a holiday or a trip out to Uluru or what was commonly known as Ayers Rock. In the middle of Australia, it over the years have drawn, you know, thousands and thousands of people into Australia and into obviously the middle of Australia to the desert areas. And, you know, when you look at Uluru and you look at one time when the big pegs were put into that rock formation and people were, you know, encouraged, although the traditional elders obviously didn't like it, but, you know, the governments had total control over the site, which allowed tourists to climb the rock and to get up on top of the rock and, you know, it was uncanny, although some people did slip and, and, and lose their life on the rock, there wasn't as many as what, you know, obviously statistics from other areas show uh, when coming onto sites like Uluru. And, you know, when you look at that damage uh, done, it can't be sort of, um, you know, repaired. The damage remains in terms of those embedded uh, you know, erasions of the rock's face and will do probably for generations to come. So I think the pegs have all been, still pegs have all been bought out from, uh, you know, the rock. And that was, a, I think, a day in which the traditional owners celebrated. But it was also a day of massive media coverage around Australia that, you know, obviously didn't like the fact that the, um, you know, traditional people had that right to say no to the climbing of the rock. And uh, so therefore that, yeah, damage occurs and is still there. And the other thing too is to take note of the fact that, you know, it's not just backpacker tourism that goes into these places. It's some of the world's most richest, you know, people, some of the world's most richest tourists that go to Uluru. And so Uluru itself is surrounded, if you like, by... Um, you know, quite a number, you know, 10 or, you know, 12 major big resorts that would be, you know, multi-million dollar resorts. And, of course, again, with the wealth of those dripping in Gucci and all of the world's greatest brands of jewellery and, you know, perfume and, you know, having uh, twilight um, dinners after a trip to Uluru, you've only got to go around to the northeastern part of the rock to see the conditions of the traditional owners of the rock at Madajulu, which is a Aboriginal community that are living in, you know, no less than third world conditions. Some people say four, fourth world conditions. So, you know, the uh, compared difference between, you know, a visitor to Uluru, a tourist, and the traditional owners is stark. And I think, you know, one must ask the question, what are the traditional owners getting out of any form of the benefit of tourism onto this sacred site. And there are also, you know, sacred sites around North Queensland. There's a massive site at Babinda, which is, um, you know, called the Boulders. And it's a skin group story of where, um, you know, a woman and a man who shouldn't have been together uh, by their law was, and so therefore it was a punishment by death. And in that particular um, site, there's said to be a spirit that dwells, which is the spirit of the woman. And there's been a massive and an uncanny amount of males who have drowned at the Babinda boulders over, uh, you know, the years that it has and become a tourist attraction. You look at Wave Rock here in the southwest and, uh, you know, the damage done at Wave Rock by, you know, um, tourism. And, uh, you know, you've also got a lot of Aboriginal sacred sites in this country that have been turned into ecotourism. So I just want to um, you know, reiterate that on that first um, point. And then the appropriation of art styles and symbols, um, well, of course, that's commonplace. And tourism commodities and products, we'll show some of them shortly. 
the exploitation of the ecological knowledge. And as Selena said, that gives you know, evidence to a lot of our uh, traditional flora and fauna being turned into new age lotions and potions and also used in different um, forms of medicine as well um, through pharmaceutical companies worldwide without any um, connection or, you know, credits being given to people who have been using that flora for medical purposes, uh, you know, since the beginning of time. Traditional music, dance and art is another major issue in which the wall of shame depicted and it was a... Um, you know, an issue dealing with the way in which uh, our cultural, uh, you know, ceremonial dance or movements, if you like, were capitalised on and become like forms of ballet and, and, and within theatre uh, presentations. Stolen cultural and ceremonial objects, we spoke about that earlier, and of course then identity appropriation. And I would say since the Marlo Morgan campaign, uh, you know, in the... 1990s, the mid-1990s, if one was to be asked whether or not you believe that, you know, that type of exploitation, you know, through respect of our culture and our people has, you know, subdued or, you know, got worse, I would, as an individual, say it, it's no doubt got a lot, lot more negative, a lot, lot more exploitation to this day's happening regarding our culture and our spirituality. And, you know, it's a type of um, spirituality in which, you know, Dumbatung often refers to as, um, you know, a spiritual warfare, nearly, in terms of what's happening to our, uh, our culture and art. But I'll just share with you, if I can, um, some of the uh, you know, uh, examples that we had on the wall of shame in the day in which we had them set up at uh, Dumbatung. So here, firstly, you've got all these um, types of figurines that have been, um, you know, uh, moulded into, you know, and sold through tourist shops. Like you've got this, um, what's supposed to be a Aboriginal warrior here holding a spear, which is actually a skewer, and painted up. And you know, you've got your characteristics of what you might call an Aboriginal, you know, facial structure. So they've given the little um, mould a, a huge nose, lips, and you know, I mean, it's real um, sort of, um, you know, dehumanising, not much unlike the gollywog um, syndrome in uh, the United States that was, you know, completely banned through the activism of, um, you know, of Afro-Americans. And, and I think these things should be banned as well. So, you know, you've got a whole heap of those that make up the, uh, the wall of shame. I just want to show you this one here because, you know, it says made in Australia and it's, of course, a... Aboriginal uh, woman and I'll never forget when this was on the wall of shame and a very noted and well-known, quite famous actually, Aboriginal woman named Josie Boyle. Now she taught Aboriginal culture and, and shared it with many, many non-Aboriginal people. But I remember her coming into Dumbatung one day and saying, Robert, look at that, that's disgusting, she said, because look at the little mini skirt type thing on the doll. And you know, she said, look, our women never, ever appeared to be like that. So, you know, again, that's uh, been on the wall of shame for a long, long time. This here is um, along with, you know, a number of other items that fall into the same category, quite disturbing. And you can see here, um, you know, all of the uh, artefacts and objects of our people. Like you've got a, a boomerang down here, you've got a codger or a coach, a wooden stone axe here, spears and a shield. And you can see there are no more, you know, Aboriginal designs and a cartoon is, you know, Australia, handkerchief. And, you know, the reason that was on the wall of shame because we know what we do with handkerchiefs. We, um, you know, spit and or blow our noses into handkerchiefs. So to have that as part of the wall of shame I think was important when it's noted exactly what they're, um, they're used for. And I want to show you just a few more. This is a mask, um, of course, uh, depicting an Aboriginal face of a man. And again, you can see the big, you know, red googly lips. Um, you can see the eye in still one of the um, uh, sockets here. And, you know, again, it's a, it's a party theme that I just think is, again, um, extremely uh, shameful in relationship to what it represents. 
This one here is a very interesting um, example, actually. It was uh, a one time produced by McDonald's. As you can see, the McDonald's emblem down on the, the left side there. And it was a placemat for their trays that they bought out to um, you know, the restaurant tables, for particularly for young children. And their parents were on here, says, encourage your child to learn Aboriginal storytelling. And, you know, you can see the, the placemat. It's got dot and circle. And then it shows actual symbols, which are, and some of these are very ancient symbols. And, you know, where McDonald's have got these from, of course, and the knowledge of these symbols are from, you know, museum archives or, you know, uh, artists or whatever. So up the top here, you've got uh, a, a symbol that represents a star, one that represents rain, another representing boomerang, another sitting uh, down place, a waterhole, emu tracks, kangaroo tracks, uh, possum tracks, a human, and two men sitting uh, is this symbol here, and then campfire and rainbows. But in actual fact, the two men sitting is the uh, design in which Western Desert artists and artists from Papunya used to actually uh, observe the presence of a woman. So the arch is actually a woman, not a man. So again, there's a defined, um, you know, for the one of, you know, the mat, uh, descriptive of something that's completely wrong. It's not women, sorry, it's not men, it's women. And then McDonald says here to use these uh, symbols to create your story within the placemat and the centre part here. And, of course, a little box of um, colouring in pencils were supplied with this. And it says, you know, can you draw like this? Symbols in the Aboriginal art from the central desert area. Here's what you do. Colour your story, fill in your name, age, address and place in the competition, which is here, the entry form. Uh, McDonald's, a family restaurant or that art or the Art Gallery of Western Australia. Entries closed Sunday the 17th of October 1993. The age of competition entrance will be taken into consideration by the judges whose decision is final. Winners will be notified from October the 18th, 1993. Great prizes. The best entry from each McDonald's restaurant will receive an exclusive dot and circle gift pack and a McDonald's family food voucher. Total prize value of $50. So, you know, they're using Aboriginal art and cultural symbols here to promote their junk food. And, uh, you know, their food has also created other mass problems around the world regarding, you know, child obesity. And, you know, it's about time McDonald's was pulled into place. Now, I know that it goes way back to 1993. However, Dumbatung and another well-known Aboriginal woman actually protested strongly about this placemat being a part of the McDonald's so-called, you know, experience. And it was pulled out of the McDonald's chain of restaurants and the competition closed. So again, with a bit of activism, you can actually, uh, you know, stop this sort of exploitation from happening. And this here... Uh, is another example. You can see the little black fella sitting on the uh, the toilet bowl, and what the toilet bowl actually is is a salt and pepper shaker. So um, you know, again, this is here is you know pretty offensive ornament to have a you know to have around uh, your, one's house. These are tarot cards, and for those who know how the tarot card is used by the New Age. Uh, encroachment into all Indigenous cultures worldwide. You can see on these um, tarot cards you've got Aboriginal designs, you've got um, names such as Alatucha, um, these designs again of um, you know, symbols representing uh, you know, ceremonies and cultures. So, you know, on and on it goes. So, you know, these tarot cards about how you tell one's future used by New Age practitioners now bear the symbols and the um, etchings of, uh, of Aboriginal art or supposedly Aboriginal art. I want to just show a couple of last ones here and 
This is a social studies book that was promoted right through West Australian um, uh, primary schools. And, look, the offence of this really is the fact of, you know, uh, whoever published the book, which obviously is the education department, yep, and those that have put the drawings and the um, you know, the so-called knowledge of our people into this booklet, and again it was, you know, part of the primary school curriculum here in West Australia. It's got a lot of things that are, you know, quite, you know, offensive and, uh, you know, to have this as part of the curriculum, you know, I don't know, I suppose in the 1950s and 60s shows how, you know, racism constituted itself through the teachings of education. So you've got two Aboriginal men that are now capsized over the edge of the raft and into the water. And then you've got this older warrior pulling him out of the water saying, what happened? You know, and then here we go. A strange pale man pointed a stick at me. There was a loud noise and suddenly the canoe had a big hole in it. This is strange magic. Let us go and ask Daru, the medicine man. I have heard of these fire sticks. No one can stand against them. The pale warriors will drive the animals from our hunting grounds. We must move west or we shall starve. It is the end of the Wolamita, the Kamarai, the Kadi and all the Eora tribes. So, you know, it was never the end of any of the tribal people, but it was what they were promoting and what they were showing young uh, people within, again, the Australian school systems. And I just want to show this couple of last ones here. This one here is um, a small booklet that was, um, you know, a cartoon booklet, really. And for some of the uh, senior people uh, to whom will watch this podcast will certainly know these books from, again, I think the 50s and the 60s. It's called Wichity's Tribe. And uh, the uh, artist who uh, did the drawings and did the, um, you know, inscriptions uh, and depictions was a man by the name of Jolliffe. And, again, you can see how, you know, he's obviously sexualised the Aboriginal women in this particular uh, series in which he did, and he, I think, published these over a long period of, of time. So, you know, which of his tribe, it says, the carefree wanderings of Australia's Aborigines are a far cry from city bustle and worry, but you can follow the doings of the Wichity and his tribe shown here in artist Eric Jolliffe's drawings, which are also featured regularly in Pix. And that was a well-known magazine right throughout Australia. So relax at home and enjoy the Aborigines every day walk about life. So just to show you a couple, it says here, Ningla's sure a picky eater. And, of course, you can see the woman there and the man's got the turtle in his hand and he's uh, slung the turtle at her. Um, just to go through a couple more. What do you mean chocolate boxy? Um, he's a good husband and provider, thanks to my everlasting nagging. Um, couple of last ones. Hear this shell roar, honey. And uh, she's put it so that, you know, there's this huge wave coming behind him. Now the kids are married. We're thinking of looking for a smaller place and so on and so on. It's just ludicrous and it's stupidity. But what it does, it, 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 it depicts a message, if you like, or an indicative to, you know, Jolliffe's um, uh, style in making Aboriginal people look not just simplified but, you know, to look and to behave in what would be considered nearly a stupid way, uh, you know, a, a brainless way. So I think, you know, when you realise just how popular Wichity's tribe and other sort of, um, you know, then cartoon magazines depicted Aboriginal people, there's a real, you know, um, issue of concern there. And I'll just show you this as a last uh, sample. It uh, was actually a um, tourist um, uh, commodity, if you like, or item that sold right throughout Victoria and New South Wales. 
And this one's sort of offensive in its, in its own way. It's called the Australian Bush Barometer. And it's got a, a piece of string, as you can see there, hanging from the cardboard. So anyway, it reads this, the Australian Bush Barometer. The Australian weather guide is used by swagmen, cattle station, race clubs, weather forecasters, the media and throughout the outback of Australia. It may also be used by city folk. So it says, if the string is wet, it's raining. If the string is dry, it isn't raining. If the string is swaying, it's windy. If the string stands sideways, it's very windy. If the string casts shadows, it's sunny. If the string casts no shadow, it's cloudy. If the string is invisible, it's night time. The string is dark. If the string is stiff, it's freezing cold. If the string is not stiff, it's warm. If the string is smoking, your house is on fire. But if the string is missing, there's Aboriginals about. So, you know, that there in its last comment, you know, creates again this perception that all Aboriginal people are thieves and, uh, you know, it's a common, you know, uh, I suppose, thought in this country and around, you know, beware of the natives because they will steal from you. And this sort of thing here that, again, you know, sold in the thousands in the eastern states is a, um, it's a really offensive part of, uh, you know, what tourists can access regarding our people. So the Wall of Shame uh, was up at Dumbatung for many, many years. And, uh, you know, it served a purpose. And, you know, the Wall of Shame, although it, um, you know, was important, and I think, you know, again, as we said earlier, a lot of academics and a lot of people that were associated with different studies took a great note in terms of the Wall of Shame and, again, what it represented. A book was written called Old Battle, New Age about the Marlowe Morgan campaign and the um, book itself, you know, contains a, 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 quite a bit of insight into, um, you know, again, the wall of shame and the sorts of issues and, and um, subject matters that the wall of shame covered. But I just want to um, start to, you know, I suppose close this story of tribal fires. I think it's an important story, a very important story in terms of, you know, again, identifying the misappropriation and the, um, you know, use of Aboriginal cultural knowledge without permission by, you know, all of those issues that Selena read out in terms of the, you know, um, pamphlet that accompanied people that we gave to people when they came into Dumbarton uh, prior to having a look at the Wall of Shame. But I think, you know, the issue with the sacred side areas is very, very important. The exploitation of our cultural knowledge and our, you know, our um, stories that have been part of our lives as Aboriginal people for, you know, 2,000 and more generations are now, you know, used and, 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 and basically, um, you know, profited on by these interest groups. But one of the real serious issues in terms of the wall of shame was the racism and the, you know, type of racism in which, you know, in Australia in the 70s and the 80s was very prevalent. Because here in West Australia, you had, um, you know, the likes of Jack Van Tongren, who was the head of the national movement. And, you know, Jack Van Tongren took about it himself, along with his, you know, cronies, to burn down a lot of Asian restaurants in and around Perth. And, you know, there was a beautiful uh, family across, just across the roadway from Dumbatung here that owned a... Um, Chinese restaurant that means Selena got to know very well and their restaurant was burnt down by this Jack Van Tongren. So the type of racism in which all of this, you know, I suppose creeps into is the type of racism that is life-threatening. A letter that a couple of our leaders um, received um, that, uh, you know, was indicative of, you know, again, what, what this all peaks itself to be. Dear sir, what a hypocritical apology for human beings you blacks are. 
You stand there on television and make excuses for the black extreta that have wrecked havoc on the city trains. It is a waste of time you and your bunch of taxpayer-funded bludger because most Australians know that Aboriginals are short on brains and big on thuggery, drunkenness, stealing, bashing and all antisocial behaviour. If you black bludgers want to wage war against white people and their society, why don't you do it with guns so that we whites can take up arms against you? You haven't got the guts for it, for you know that this time when you start something, you and your mob of crap will be wiped out altogether. The political shit and the dumb high court have given you land rights, but white Australians don't and never will accept it, and one day we'll take it back off you, Jay Jackson. So uh, this letter was, you know, sent around to a number of uh, Aboriginal leaders of different organisations here in Perth at the time. And I just want to make a note that the actual letter uh, that was sent to the legal service also contained uh, two bullets within the letter and the envelope. So, you know, these sorts of threats, um, you know, that you know, spurts this type of racism. And you, as you heard, it's a vile racism that, um, you know, is a threat in terms of the, you know, the safety and the well-being of our people. And it was around the time in which, um, you know, Pauline Hanson in Australia was starting to, you know, gather momentum and started on a huge national speaking tour that would draw in literally, you know, thousands of people into, you know, auditoriums right around all the major cities in Australia. And when she was here in Perth, she was you know, sponsored by 6PR, which is a radio station through a well-noted shock jock. His name was Howard Sattler. And, you know, he was one of the real racist um, radio hosts that polluted the airwaves in this state through, um, you know, uh, 6PR uh, regarding racism and would always be, um, you know, criticising the worth of Aboriginal people and our culture. So, you know, all of this started to gel and and creep into the psyche of, you know, the average Australian. Every time they'd turn on their radio or they'd pick up a newspaper here, the West Australian in particular in those years, they were habitual, they were, they were severe in terms of the racism they portrayed against our people. And, you know, you can't turn back the clock on that. Howard Sattler was the one who made mention of the time that the young 14-year-old Noongar boy was killed in a high-speed car chase by the police and he died as a result of crashing the vehicle. And Howard Sattler the next morning said, well, you know, uh, he got what he deserved. And, you know, you talk about the death of a young 14-year-old, somebody's son, you know, somebody's brother. Um, Yeah, it's it's, it's just really um, sad to think that, you know, here we are stemming off from that uh, propagated um, racism into the year 2023 where we're about to go to a referendum to uh, vote whether or not Aboriginal people have a right of voice into parliament through the constitution of the country. And, you know, I hazard us to say that, you know, I would be very surprised to see the yes vote get up and that, um, constitutional change made because, you know, and in during my lifespan as an Aboriginal person, as a, you know, uh, big woman man in this country, I know that the amount of racism I've, um, you know, uh, experienced and the amount of racism in which I've, you know, encountered during my whole life would certainly, um, you know, question or not whether this, um, you know, this referendum will be successful. So, you know, in this uh, story, again, we wanted to share with, um, you know, the uh, people who will see this uh, podcast some of the, you know, issues that we as Aboriginal people have to face in relationship to how we protect our culture, our spirituality, our connection to land, our connection to 
ceremonies, our ancient language and stories in a way in which I think in the future we'll ensure that they're, you know, passed on to the following generations that will follow us in a defined way in which is, um, you know, important in terms of, um, you know, how our culture is understood by our own people. So, you know, Dumbatung is about ensuring that our truth-telling uh, and proper truth-telling is part of the, uh, you know, continuation of our uh, um, obligation and our uh, law that we abide by uh, very closely here at, um, at Dumbatung. And that, that there gives a light of, you know, flames into a darkness in the future in which our young people can access the stories and this time that Dumbatung had in terms of our initiatives and our service to the Bibbulmun people. So um, that's our story, uh, The Wall of Shame and Nations at War. And I'll close by our maxim and uh, that is... May our campfires burn forever.